Good morning and welcome to the, the reality of industrial strength Excel. <clears throat> Glad you can make it and join us. <clears throat> Certainly need to remind everybody about the cell phones. And again, I'm Mike Miskell. Uh, I'm going to be covering most of the slides here. Uh, Rob is here with me uh, to uh, act as my wingman. Yeah, I'm mostly color commentary. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, as, as I had in my profile, I've been with my organization 28 years. Uh, I've worked in a number of positions in the organization from technical sales, sales management, the customer service arena. And today, I am the director of process management. And Part of how I got into this is, from a process management standpoint, establishing standards, measures uh, for the organization. And as we continue to grow and add acquisitions, to bring those acquisitions into the fold. Part of what I want you to understand of, of me, I am absolutely an early adopter. And sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes it's not. <laughs> But you learn from that, and that's okay. I, I, I'm good with that. And in terms of uh, Excel, I do look at myself as an Excel guy. Over that e years with the company, always interested in the data. Rob sh share that I definitely have the data gene, and that's okay. Again, good. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the other aspects of my role, I work directly for uh, one of the officers of the company and often am engaged with the executives in the organization. So I have, you know, maybe a, a special perch that lets me champion some things in the organization that, and again, get some things done that helps the organization overall. Quick show of hands. How many people have seen the movie Pulp Fiction? Remember Winston Wolf, Harvey Keitel's character, the guy who solves problems? That's Mike at his, at his company. <clears throat> so in this case study, we're going to just overview the journey that we went on in the development of the solution that you're ultimately going to see. <clears throat> and a little bit about the company. The company was founded by Charlie Command back in 1945. Uh, Charlie was an aeronautical engineer and to complement his business, he started the industrial distribution business as well. The most important thing that I want to point out to you is this quote. In the corporate lobby, certainly are a lot of things and that are about Charlie's legacy. This quote is the quote that is etched in the glass wall above his picture. <clears throat> and it is, over the years, as I've met him, it is very appropriate because it is what he instilled in his company. And I would tell you, through this journey we're going to share, we needed to tap into this many times as well because there are plenty of people telling us that it can't be done. So Command Corporation is really two businesses, an aerospace business and an industrial distribution business. Um, the industrial distribution includes mechanical, electrical, automation, and fluid power kinds of products. Again, we serve all the manufacturing businesses across the U.S. and Mexico. I want to jump in really quick and say that one thing that he glossed over pretty quickly is that this company, Command, uh, in the past year has done over a billion dollars in sales. So it's not what we would call a small company. Uh, and here's someone near the very top of that company talking to you about the solution that they built for that size of an enterprise. So keep that in the back of your mind throughout all of this. And 
you know, quick view of the, the products that we do sell. Uh, you know, these products are standard products that we sell, or 50% of what we sell is either engineered or custom modified products. We do a lot of specific engineered applications with our customers to help improve their processes and productivity as well. This is where our story begins. As an organization, we were feeling the pressure of a slowing economy. We were feeling pressure on our margins. Our shareholders were looking for us to improve profitability. And we needed to find a way to improve. In fact, our president told us, fix it. Just tell everybody to do better. Well, that seemed pretty easy, doesn't it? But it's not that easy. Fix it and do better is like trying to find needles in not just a haystack, but in fields of haystacks. And how do you do that? How is that possible? The opportunity was to find a better way to find needles. The organization, as a distributor, is 180 locations across North America. It's a distributed distributor. So our people are very decentralized. People work remotely. Salespeople are on the road. So everybody's a long way from the corporate office. And when you look at the organization, you're trying to implement fixes across 180 locations, across 900 people that sell products to over 65,000 customers from 3,000 different manufacturers. The analogy I like to make a lot is our business is 1,000 miles wide and a quarter inch deep. And the challenge is, how do you find the opportunities to improve? So where is the solution? I was confident as an Excel guy and having that data gene, the solution was in the data. But the question was, how do we figure that out? We looked at lots of tools. And we spent weeks and weeks looking, reviewing, thinking about what options we have. As an organization, we have Cognos across our enterprise. We looked at how we could enhance our Cognos tool that we had in place. Quite frankly, coming from the business and understanding what the folks in the field go through and what they needed, because that's the perspective I brought, was the perspective from the folks that were in the trenches. We weren't meeting what they needed. Even though the BI team would say, but they have this, what more could they possibly want? It's very hard for me to sit quietly or stand quietly during this slide. I like this a lot. So Mike, did you look at all of those tools that are pictured there? Uh, we did. You know, and we built a matrix and, and reviewed. Some, some of the, the reviews were pretty quick. Others were certainly in more in depth. So it's not just a slide full of names we know. Uh, so I think it goes to the point you make to me, the data gene. If you're gonna do, if you're gonna have the data gene, you're gonna do the homework. That's right. So however cursory I want to be, <clears throat> the data gene kicks in and says, you need to know more. So <clears throat> what do you do? 
lots of mornings like this. I'm a morning person. Lots of mornings like this, toiling over what you're looking at, what the marketing people are giving you as information, and trying to figure out what's the right tool. <clears throat> I did this so often, even my dog had empathy for me. So, talked about life experience. And, you know, at times you pause and reflect back on life experience and say, what does life experience tell me to do? How do I, how do I navigate this? And life experience told me to keep these things in mind. The folks in the field need something they can work with. They're the consumers, not the BI team. In a lot of respects, not the management team. It's the folks in the field that need to consume the information. So, needed to keep it simple. First and foremost, it needed to be simple so they could consume it. That shouldn't be hard. Be able to find a fix that I can put across 180 locations, across 900 people, selling all these products. Heck, what's so hard about that? And, oh, by the way, the clock is ticking, and we need a decision sooner rather than later, and you better not be wrong. Yeah, Winston Wolf didn't make his reputation by being wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So, I get back to where's the solution? Again, I commented, we already have Cognos. You know, lots of coming back to me. Why can't we make that work? And regardless of how hard you try, the square peg doesn't fit in the round hole. Are there any Microsoft employees in the room willing to raise their hands? <laughs> Every time he says we already had Cognos, a Microsoft employee gets their wings. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch for them sprouting. So, again, I already pointed out, keep it simple. So how do we keep it simple? What could be simpler than Excel? Everyone in our organization had it. Everybody used it. Everybody's familiar with it. What a, what a perfect place. In fact, Rob reminds me, the most common thing each and every one of the other people say is, and we export our data to Excel. <laughs> okay. So, Excel came out with this thing called Power Pivot. So what does that mean? Well, I was curious, that early adopter in me, saying, how does this fit? The fact that it can help me manage millions of rows of data. I said, okay, because I had millions of rows of data. In fact, upwards of a little over five million rows of data that I wanted to get in. These turned the light on for me as being the game changer. It met a lot of the criteria I was looking for. So we looked to move forward. And to share with you a little glimpse, before I tell you more about the journey, of some of the things that we built in Excel, I'll share with you. And no, there's nothing wrong with your glasses, or your eyes suddenly didn't go out of focus. I want to stay employed, so I can't show you the actual numbers. I enjoy my job. My wife is certainly comfortable with her way of living, and we're not looking to make that change. So, but I think you can get the gist. We created scorecards that today is the same scorecard from the president all the way down to the salesperson. Exactly the same. 
using cube formulas in power pivot. We figured out we can put slicers on them. Cool. Now I can shape the data even further. <clears throat> I can create pivot charts. I can show trends. I can show good things and bad things and where things are going. And I can create lots of them because, as I said, our business is a thousand miles wide and that becomes part of the challenge is they need lots of views. And so it's actually worth emphasizing again that <clears throat> you know, these aren't, you know, screenshots of mock-ups. I mean, these are, these are taken from the production application uh, that you guys have deployed, right? Absolutely. Okay. So the, you know, hence the blurring of the data. Absolutely. Okay. So we could, beyond the scorecard, create pivot tables. And we could create a wide variety of pivot tables. And to those pivot tables, we could offer different families of slicers to, again, help the folks in the field segment the business they want to look at. Take that thousand miles wide and be able to cut it into chunks that they can, they can comprehend. They can understand what's going on in their, in their data. For some of the users that have a little bit more skill than just being able to open Excel, because everything I've shown you so far, the person that can open Excel can get that far. If you're at least a little bit advanced, you've got filters and sorts you can use to modify your data. And for those folks that are even advanced beyond that, they got the field list. They can take what we've constructed and, again, use the calculated fields we've created so the formulas are right and the data's right and create some mo custom modified reports that they need. Visuals, lots of visuals. <clears throat> Did I mention we have a lot of salespeople in our organization? Pictures help a lot. We did take all of this and we've hosted it on SharePoint. This, everything you're seeing is in Excel 2013, that early adopter thing, and SharePoint 2013. And the beauty of that is Whatever that they have available to them from that SharePoint site, and you'll see more, there's a lot, they have the ability to download a native workbook with their data to their desktop, and it gives them that full, rich reporting in 10 seconds. Mike keeps stressing that he's an early adopter, and there's, there's a lot of truth to that for sure, but you know, you might think of that and say that, you know, start to get the, this impression that he might be a little bit reckless. He's anything but reckless. He's very careful. And there's also, in my view, a little bit of an irony in a self-described early adopter selecting Excel over all these other new fancy things that, you know, tend to get a lot of uh, excitement and buzz, right? There is a little bit of irony in, in that. Um, so yeah, early adopter with regard to the power pivot thing, absolutely. But that kind of cuts both ways, doesn't it? That's why you saw the picture earlier with me at my desk. <laughs> because I also learned in Excel a long time ago. You can always figure it out. There's always a way. So get back to what I started with. Keep it simple. So <clears throat> as we got the green light to go forward, we were allowed to put together this team. Certainly I was one of the folks on the team. Oh, and I got reminded that uh, I could do this project, but I still needed to keep all the other responsibilities I had. And the other fellow that's up there is Donovan. And Donovan's based in Salt Lake a long-time employee of the company. He's got the data gene, too. 
And the other part that's great about him is he is the ultimate data mechanic. He loves putting this stuff together and he's good at it. The other thing I'll comment, he rarely makes a mistake because when he gets done putting it together, it's right. But I'm not going to tell you Donovan's last name. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly, part of this team and a critical part of this team has been Rob. And the, and the collaboration that we've had uh, really, in my mind, has been the perfect team. Really huge team though, right? I mean, yeah. two people part-time inside your company, me even like part-part-time. Uh, this is very much, you know, like we talk about, you know, us, we, whatever, who, who did this, it's really them. Uh, like I've, I would occasionally provide a little bit of advice or something along those lines or a little jump start. Um, but the vast majority of the work here and the solution, a lot of these things are things that I'm seeing this week for the first time. Because uh, I wasn't hands-on involved with every little, every little part of it. Um, and I think that's really uh, a very important thing to understand. Yeah, and I, I think you know, part of what we were talking about the other day, how you know, we would come up against an obstacle, you'd help us get a path forward, whether it was a <clears throat> way to construct the, a calculated measure or it was help with a macro. And you know, kind of the comment of Donovan, you feed them that information, you go away for a week or two, and you come back and never a question, poof, there it is. Yeah. So so. Some, some people, when you send them something and you don't hear back at all, it's sometimes it's a little bit spooky. It's not the case with these guys. Like I'll send a macro over or something like that and never hear back. That means that they're using it, applying it, modifying it, running with it. <laughs> and I sleep easy. So getting back to our journey, how did we get to needing this and wanting this and having interest in doing this? As I commented, in February of 2013, sales were down. Margins in our business had been sliding and had been sliding for 10 months up until that point. And <clears throat> Again, the president told us to fix it. We're one team. We all need to strive to one result. Well, that's great. <clears throat> you go across the organization, and they all have a thousand and one opinions of where the fix is. Wait a minute. You only told me there were 900 people. How can you have a thousand and one? Clearly, many of them had multiple opinions and they could swap between A or B depending on what conversation they were having. The other part of this was the, the data that was out there. Hundreds, okay, likely thousands of Excel spreadsheets and like DNA, no two the same. In fact, I'd get feedback from some of the senior and executive managers of saying, my head hurts after looking at all the different ways this data is being put together by the folks in the field. Yeah, so a couple of quick points to underline there. First of all, another ironic point that the solution to a bad Excel problem was, was Excel. Right? Uh, and it ended up being a truthfully good solution. Now, the, the missing ingredient there is power pivot. Uh, it wasn't you know, just pure Excel versus Excel. That's one thing that I wanted to underline. Uh, and I've actually forgotten the other thing I wanted to underline, so that's, uh, that's not going to work out very well for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to it. So understanding one team, one result, but all these opinions, but why aren't we getting better? I made reference to this quote earlier. This is Charlie's quote. And again, I had lots and lots of people that were telling me, why are you wasting your time doing that? 
There are other things you need to be doing that are more important. One of them wasn't my boss. He was a believer. But in June of 2013, we had figured out that the epicenter of everything power pivot resided in Ohio. In fact, everything high tech, right? Comes, comes from Ohio. It's the second only to Silicon Valley and by a narrow margin. Rob, so Rob, where, where's your home? I live in, uh, in Cleveland, in the Rust Belt. <laughs> so I've been there, I can tell you it's a lot, no, it's, it's, it's you know, not particularly a, a hub of high tech activity. So, <clears throat> part of how our journey began is Rob was hosting a week-long training session, a big component of Power Pivot, Donovan, myself, and even Donovan saying, why am I going to Ohio? But the thing that was so sweet about going to Ohio for that week, beyond the relationship that we've begun with Rob, is I now was convinced Excel was the right tool. There was no doubt in my mind that I could do whatever the executive team wanted. And we have. I also want to point out that Mike and Donovan decided to skip the trampoline park party that we threw the next day uh, in Columbus. Uh, as a result of which I spent the next two months in bed and then the next three months learning to walk again. So uh, it was a wise decision on his part. I've, with, with me being as close to Mike for the second time in my life, I'm holding onto this chair so I don't fall off the stage or something. <laughs> <laughs> so as we, you know, I came back from Ohio and the executive team is saying, Show us proof of what you can do. Show us proof of how this is going to work. And <clears throat> there were demonstrations. And I don't know about your executive team, but I can tell you about our executive team. They have lots of questions. <laughs> lots and lots of questions. And this happened <clears throat> several times. In fact, as we moved into the latter part of the summer, the president said, I'd like you to come show what you're doing and I'm going to invite the CEO. Oh, great. <laughs> Actually, it was great. And I had nothing to do with any of these prototypes that he's talking about other than that class that he spent two days in. Uh, I wasn't hands-on at all. I didn't really even know what was going on with you guys. And I was, you know, recovering from surgery. <laughs> um, so this is all them behind the scenes doing this uh, themselves. So we gave the executives what I would call limited workbook. You know, we gave them a remote desktop into some of the things so they could get accustomed to slicing and navigating around. <clears throat> it worked. They ultimately agreed to fund putting a SharePoint application in. A lot to be said giving them hands-on and having it be what they need it to be. And, and there was, through the demonstrations, a tremendous opportunity for myself and certainly my boss to spend time why what we're putting together is important for the field how it helps them to come to the best conclusions so they can carry out the best actions going forward. And that's a really important point that I've seen over and over and over again. If you're trying to win support and approval for a, like a, a power pivot infection uh, at your company, the, by far the best way to do it is to go build something real fast, uh, something that's, that's that you know, generates numbers that they've never seen before, that they know that they want, uh, and do it in such a short period of time that they, uh, they, have, they have to recognize how dramatic that is. 
Like, wait, how long did this take you? And then you show it to them, the people who need to, whose approval you need to win, and you basically tease them with it and say, well, you know, we could do more of this. You could have this if you want. Or I could, you know, I could just go throw it away if, you, if you're okay with that, you know. Uh, and they, without a doubt, they never tell you to go throw it away. Uh, all the talk in the world, all of the principles and all of the themes that you could drive home, you know, all of that is incredibly ineffective relative to go build something, put it in front of them, and tell them that they, we could do that. That only took us, you know, X amount of time. Imagine what we could do if you gave us more X. When was the more X supposed to come? Hey, you know, <laughs> they allowed you to continue. <laughs> yes, right? they did. And they funded <laughs> things like SharePoint. Right? So uh, you got what you needed. Yeah. So the scorecard that you saw actually started in September. We got Rob to get off the couch. But this was the actual mock-up put together in Excel with executive input. And we started there. It evolved over the weeks to a mock-up that came out in October. Understanding cubes, understanding slicers. It evolved more because we included some different measures and really got to be, you know, really getting to some of the granularity and the segmentation that we ultimately establish as the standard common language across the company. Because we didn't have that. And can I jump in for a second here really quick? Not that I really need permission, I've been doing it. No. Uh, so um, there's a statistic, I always forget what the number is, but the number of days it takes on average for uh, a column to be added to a report. Does anyone know that number? It's like eight or 10 business days or something like that. Yeah, seven or eight, something else. And it's more than a week to add a single column to a report on average. That's like an industry <laughs> stat. Uh, these are whole like evolutions, iterations on the entire approach that they're short looping with the business and with the executives. And it's not like it's a single column changing. I mean, they're evolving this in real time very, very quickly. And the team is still, throughout all of this, uh, the two of these guys uh, who also have other jobs. Um, that, should, that should really, <laughs> that's a very dramatic change from uh, eight days for a column. And I'm showing you the evolution of the scorecard <clears throat> in parallel was all the work that was also going into the host of pivot tables that were being created and pivot charts. So there are many things working in parallel. So because we're at a business intelligence conference, one of the criteria is I need to show you the diagram view. <laughs> You've got to underline the industrial strength part of the industrial strength Excel. Right? There's a model behind the scenes that's generating all of these metrics. Um, you can look at all the, the Excel screenshots and start to you know, be fooled, perhaps, that this is still just regular old Excel. But those numbers that you're seeing and the charts you're seeing in Excel are just a window, just a window, into this model, this powerful business model that's been built behind the scenes in Power Pivot. And that's the industrial strength, you know, the, the engine, uh, if you will. And the other piece that came out of this, so we've got our transaction data across a couple of years. It's north of 5 million rows of transactions. But then to that transaction data, we created a lot of attribute tables, many of which were new for us. But we could create them. They said, can you do this? And the answer is, Yes, and we'd create a table, we'd attach it, and now they could have it. Also, lots of calculated fields. We built and built and built calculated fields. But Measures. again, this brought, this brought about consistency in the data because <clears throat> routinely, <clears throat> Every report you saw, the, the standing line underneath it, but it doesn't match the data from any other report that's similar to this. 
the reports we build out of here, they're all, they all match up. They all sync out. They all tie out perfectly. That whole discussion about where did your data come from and why isn't it right has evaporated in our organization because of this. Oh, yeah, I finally remember the second point I was going to make earlier, which is, again, it's sort of, and in some sense, counterintuitive in a way that uh, we're hearing a lot of the one version of the truth theme here over and over and over again. And Excel and Power Pivot are front and center uh, in the solution to bring unity. Uh, that's, you know, again, relative to traditional experience, this is the opposite of what we would expect. But the, the world has changed quite a bit. Again, uh, keeping in compliance with the rules, uh, showing you some calculations <laughs> that we built. Uh, again, it's lots of, lots of this foundational work that got done. But this work also just evolved. We built on it. We didn't need to figure this all out at first. And one of the things we absolutely found is once you got in the water and figured the first few out, you, know, you got through that initial learning curve, and the, the initial learning curve is like this. But it's something you can accomplish in a short period of time. The rest of it moved along really well. Of course, it's great having uh, the ace in your pocket when you do get stuck. And for those of you who are not familiar with Power Pivot, these formulas that you're seeing here, they're written once. Uh, and they're in the master model that's being built. And they're used you know, potentially in dozens of different scorecards, reports, et cetera. But you always know that the logic is the same. Uh, and in a complicated business, that's very difficult. It's actually impossible to do with a bunch of decentralized spreadsheets, which of course is one of the, you know, the ongoing problems and complaints. Question? Great question. So the question is, how did we get people to give up what they were doing to do this instead? Yeah, the original spreadsheets that they've, you know, they're, they're babies that they've created. How do, how do you get that pride out of their fingers? So first off, the reports we were providing were by far, far, in a way, much richer than anything they were producing. And when we showed them they could get this data in minutes, instead of them toiling for hours and days, it became real easy. In fact, as the managers became more aware of this, the emphasis was, don't spend time doing that. It's already done. Spend time making a difference. And, and, and certainly, we had some laggards in that process as well. Question? So, they're, they're, so the question is, how do you know and figure out the right resources and configuration for SharePoint? Uh, talked a lot about we were a small team. And I absolutely reached out the toiling you've seen me doing, figuring out what solution to go with. I, I did something very similar with which provider because Oh, in our business, we're in the midst of doing a major ERP implementation across our company. And the IT department looked at me and said, not us. So we went with a remotely hosted solution. That solution is with a company called Plex Hosted. Uh, Rob was certainly a valuable asset in that process. In, determining the SharePoint resources we need. And we also brought on a SharePoint developer, and that organization is 
called SparkHound. And uh, <clears throat> they're actually based in the southern US, and I'm in the north, but they came with good recommendations, and I'll tell you what, all the choices I made, I could not be more pleased. The, the site performs impeccably. It really does. We have not had one glitch. And let me just add on to that. So there's really sort of two components to it. So there's sizing, you know, how much resources, RAM, horsepower, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you know, I've over time developed a pretty good set of heuristics for that. That are, you know, it's it's never precise science. It's a little bit of an a little bit of an art. Um, but in terms of like installing and configuring and all that kind of stuff, like I, I, I don't do that even myself. I, I always get help with that. And you know, then there's the, the things like Power BI, which are an option uh, for a lot of people. You know, in, in, in Mike's case, we already knew right off the bat that his workbooks were uh, and models were too large for the current Power BI. So it was a pretty easy thing for us to check off. We needed, we knew we needed to go someplace else. So to give you some perspective, any of the workbooks we were using were anywhere from 750 megs to just north of a gig. So, so they were sizable workbooks. Question? So first off, I accomplished something from the standpoint of we were doing everything on Excel 2013 and they were only on Excel 2010. <laughs> so that was a, a wrench in it for them. But you know, within SharePoint, uh, there, there are things you can do to block and limit that and we took steps to do that what they download and what you saw was is referred to as a snapshot but it is truly an Excel static workbook so they can add to it uh, and when they saw they could get that there the, there was really no reason to go any further and yeah, just to kind of further emphasize that you can set the security in SharePoint so that people can download a snapshot which is essentially like print to Excel you see the charts and the numbers and all that kind of stuff, and it's in Excel, so they can always, you know, export. You could then copy paste charts to PowerPoint, all that kind of stuff. But the original file might have been, you know, 800 megabytes on the server with all of the calculations and data in it. What you download is just, you know, like 30k, uh, and it doesn't have the business logic. So from a, a one version of the truth standpoint and a, you know, just data and business logic security standpoint, it's a wonderful solution. Question. So absolutely. Uh, repeat the question, if you would. So, so the, the question was, you know, a large organization, certain people are only going to be able to see certain portions of the data. So as, as an organization, we had areas, and we segmented the data into areas. So there is a Rob trick that we were shared, because we wanted to keep applying, keep our simple strategy. So we created the Power Pivot workbooks and we created a sheet that had the slicer for all the areas on it. So when we deployed the workbooks to the SharePoint site, that page was pre-selected for that, or that slicer was pre-selected for that area, but then that sheet wasn't published to the SharePoint application. So by default, that's what people got was only their area but for us where it was great so I had nine sites to distribute across I was building one workbook and just renaming it nine times and I'm done we have macros you know that we use to take that one base workbook blow out nine copies of it select the slicer to each region hide the sheet save it so you're not having to maintain nine different versions of it uh, it's always, you know, back to a master. 
Yeah, I mean, the security level, like, the security level of SharePoint is essentially, like, file and folder level. Right. Right? So, like, if you've got nine different security groups, you're fine. If you have 500 different security groups, it becomes, you know, a bit out of hand. Most places I go, though, the number of different security levels is actually, you know, manageable. And this solution, I mean, it's, it's kind of a brute force hack solution. I mean, it's not pretty necessarily, but it absolutely works. And, when, and from that standpoint, it's really hard to, to take issue with it. So just to share, uh, you know, what did we build? So there are 24 published workbooks in each of the nine sites that people have access to. It works off of 5 million rows of records, 14 different data tables. And again, it's all deployed on SharePoint. Question? Where do you share it? Yeah. I'm sorry? Where do you pull in your data from in that process? Is that part of the so, uh, Where's the ETL? So, in this is there a data warehouse, <laughs> data mart? What is it? You're, you're liking this, aren't you? I love this question. <laughs> so right now, it's Cognos. <laughs> <laughs> so right now it's Cognos. By the end of this month, we'll have a pipe laid from Teradata directly into our SQL Server and we'll feed our data daily. Right now we're only doing a monthly refresh on the data. But <clears throat> beginning early in June, we'll have our, our daily update going. And just to put a little extra detail on that, like it, it, there's a joke here, but it's again, based in truth. Like, as far as I can tell, uh, in my professional career recently, Cognos is a fantastic source of data for PowerPivot. Uh, and so it's, it's coming out, you know, uh, as text exports. But aren't you also, weren't you also running sort of like a, a lightweight SQL data mart yep. on a desktop somewhere? So, so you, were, yep. you were staging everything in, in that, right? For yep. So we, we ran our own SQL desktop database and worked with the folks from the BI team to create the SQL statement to extract it from Cognos. Yeah, and that's a, that is a wonderful technique. I always encourage people to start with a database if they can, even if the data is coming as text from some sort of export system. You get a lot of flexibility even just starting out with the lightest weight of databases to start out with. Well, a lot of questions. Question now. here. So we're, so we're looking at it. The question. So, so I'm sorry. So the question is, you know, when, when do we consider moving from power? So it, it's something we're looking at. Uh, right now I don't have, what we're doing is satisfying our needs. I always try to anticipate and be two or three moves ahead. Uh, so we're in the learning process and, you know, still not quite sure of, how early of an adopter I want to be there because getting mixed reviews. So to, to, be, uh, to be continued for me at this time. I don't know if there's anything more you want to add. For those of you on the recording, the question was, <laughs> when do you move from Power Pivot models to uh, SSAS tabular, which is a great thing you can do. You take your Power Pivot model, import it into Visual Studio as a tabular project. Uh, you don't have to rebuild anything. You're just off and running. Um, I anticipate that you'll probably go there eventually, but there's no rush um, until, until things reach the point where our solution with the workbooks and all of that sort of uh, starts to collapse on its own weight or until you need you know, a really fine level of security. Uh, I don't see any reason. Question? So, do you we, work for Microsoft? <laughs> <laughs> Lob that softball right up there. <laughs> Repeat the question, please. This is really important. <laughs> so, the question is if we're already uh, on a Cognos Enterprise, why didn't we build the scorecards in Cognos? So, I'm going to be quite frank. I'm not, sh I don't know why we didn't, but what I will tell you is one of the demonstrations we did with the executive team included the BI team and the Cognos consultant and two days 
after that meeting, the recommendation from the Cognos consultant was to go forward with your power pivot solution. Yeah. That came in an email, and Mike will ransom that email framed off to Microsoft for a million dollars. Any takers? I only take 10%. I, I, I could use early I only retirement. Take of that, yeah. <laughs> Question? So the scorecard is built all on hey, cube Mike, formulas. It's one of those great questions. It's answered yeah. by the next slide. Okay. So maybe we should just do that after this after this slide. Okay. So, yeah. Well, we will. So on the next we'll, slide, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. So quick glimpse of what we have in our Insight Center. Each Insight Center has the same suite of folders. Uh, <clears throat> we we also now contain our phone data in there. Uh, so they see that when we get the pipe we'll have the daily sales reports and then the other two folders hold again the suite of reports that are there but I want to talk about the top one which is KGA its command goal deployment or assignment and we have had that in place in the company for years but again it's been a challenge to get to the specific data we now created all of the appropriate pivot tables that exactly mirror the goals and the results for their goal deployment. And the other part that's in here is we started a program for our organization called a Growth Dividend Partners. And it's a program between our sales team and our suppliers to provide incentive for the specific brands we're looking to grow the business with, because there's some that are more strategic than the other. We did not deploy that program previously because it was so challenging to do all of the reporting for the suppliers, the product category, the sales territories, the customers. It was just not an endeavor that we were willing to add on additional resources to do that reporting. We launched the program because we conquered that in Power Pivot. Yeah, that, I love that. So normally, normally, we, we talk about the lack of good data, the lack of good reporting and analytics it is, is hurting us because it's, it's not informing us about things we're already doing. In this case, they knew they couldn't even do something really important for the business because they lacked reporting on it. It was an obstacle to actually deploying a new program, and this plugged that that hole. And the second point here is that I found out about this, this KGA thing from Mike yesterday. Uh, so in other words, I, again, I had nothing to do with it. So you got a, a consultant who makes his living doing these sorts of things, standing on stage bragging that he didn't get paid for this. Okay? <laughs> I love this. This is fantastic. This is what I live for. Uh, I need, I, I, this is what I do all the time and I love it. So. Back to the question about the scorecards and how did we do those. So the very first one we have up here in the upper left is the scorecard that we created. And it is based on cube formulas. In fact, in the scorecard, we are north of 400 cube formulas building that scorecard. And again, I'll reiterate, it's the same scorecard for the president, for the area manager, the regional manager, the district manager, for the salesperson. They're identical. And they're all accessible, assuming you've got permissions for that level, in 15 seconds. You click the slicer, you have the result. Next, we deployed standard pivot tables to give people the data. You know, when they were looking at their scorecard, now I want to look at what makes up the data in the scorecard. I want to understand. I want to get a bigger perspective so I know what's going on. And if we get to a point of needing to understand more, there's a group of flattened pivot tables that get people to the specific transactions that make up the segment of business they're looking at. And the slicers are all coordinated so that People can replicate what they're looking for 
to ultimately get to the transactions to help folks understand. And then, but of course, there's pivot charts. And in the case of the deployment of the scorecard, as an example, that scorecard is as a standard has five worksheets in it. So the main scorecard, and then there's what we call a quick look scorecard for someone that's looking for something a little less intense. Then there's a sheet with a suite of uh, charts on it. There's a dozen charts, so that's all standard. Then we put, you see here all the coloring. We use um, conditional formatting to create uh, company standards. And we tell people, are they adding to or detracting from the company's overall performance? Because just because I'm better than I was last year than this year, I'm better this year than I was last year, how do I stack up against the company? We couldn't give them that perspective. Now we can. So you may have gotten better, but you're still not where you need to be. That's a wonderful perspective to have. Yeah, don't sleep on Excel, regular old Excel, as a visualization and reporting layer, OK? Like in the, in the hands of someone who is good at Excel and has been spending a lot of time in Excel, you can make it do things that almost no other tool can do. Uh, and so I encourage you to keep that in mind. You know, what might look like you know, flashy over here compared to, you know, I don't understand Excel. When you find one of those people who's good at Excel, you can go a long way with it. We went, we have come a long, long way in conquering misinformation. That is huge in our organization, and I suspect in yours. Because if people don't have good information, how can they possibly be doing good things? Because they're lucky? I don't know. I don't want to have my business run on luck. The other part here is we commented on already. We moved people away from creating Excel workbooks that weren't right in the first place to taking action. So. The question, have, have we had any impact? I think the green bars speak for themselves. The final blurry the, chart. The other, the other piece I would tell you, have we had impact? So at the beginning of this week, I got an email from our CFO with an attachment. <clears throat> In that attachment were multiple pages of napkins that he had sketched out on what he's looking to get developed as other workbooks to have for the organization. We have that teleconference on Monday. The infection so, spreads. Question? Well, I mean, the, the, the question is, as the inspection spreads to other departments, other divisions of the company, how do you control and keep, you know, keep chaos out? It's the same thing over and over again. You have a small team of people who are associated with the production of these models and reports, and then a larger team that's consuming them. And the, typically, the ratio is like 1 to 15. You do not put power pivot production tools in the hands of everybody. You do not give everyone rights to upload. You empower a small subset. They're kind of like your ambassadors. You know? And, and they work very closely with the business leaders in that regard. So it, it, doesn't, it actually is not a problem in practice once you understand that you're not supposed to put power pivot production authoring in everybody's hands. So, and uh, let me just, and I'll come to your question. The other half of the question I didn't finish with the point I was making with our CFO, the other half of the conversation is what are the steps <clears throat> that he needs to begin to take to get his 12 finance analyst on the power pivot. OK. 
can I field this one really? I mean, you, so the question is, you've got these Excel people, maybe you're not designating all of them as approved authors for publishing and all of that, but aren't they still going to get a hold of Power Pivot and do crazy things with it? Absolutely they are. Okay? But the thing is, the, the crazy things they do with Power Pivot are so much less crazy than the stuff they were doing in regular Excel. Like, in, in regular Excel, you write the same semantic formula sometimes hundreds of times in one week. You write it once in Power Pivot, debug it, test it, okay? The chances of them making mistakes and wasting time goes down dramatically, right? So it's not like it's creating a problem you didn't have. In fact, quite the opposite. It's lessening the impact of a problem you already have. So even if they get a hold of it, honestly, things are going to get better. Uh, I mean, it doesn't get any worse than what it is today. It doesn't. And, and because the entry to get in, writing those formulas, is a challenge, and we make so much available, there's really a lot of tendency not to go that way. Other questions? What are the slides that I mentioned about core and thin? What, that? what are core and thin workbooks? So it's uh, basically hub and spoke. It's an Excel workbook that contains the Power Pivot model. I call that the core workbook. And then you can have a bunch of satellite workbooks that contain just the reporting layers, pivot tables, et cetera. And they don't have the model in them, but they refer to the published model on SharePoint. So you're sort of using the published model on SharePoint, the workbook, as if it was a SSAS tabular cube or something like that. Excel doesn't know the difference. In 2013, that's actually kind of tricky to do. Like the, the, the changes made in 2013 Excel actually make it virtually impossible to set up that arrangement uh, on your own. But we hacked around that. We figured that out. Uh, and also that core and thin thing that we talked about does not work today anyway on Power BI. It doesn't work on the Microsoft Cloud. It only works in the sort of the on-premises version of, of, uh, of SharePoint 2013. But part of what that does for us, we have one core and we have 60, 70 workbooks leveraging that one core of data. That reduces we the strain, the, the RAM usage, everything on the server, and also the maintenance effort right. of having to maintain copies of it. I, I update one workbook, and I've effectively updated 60. Yeah. So how, how, about if, how about if you see us afterwards? Yeah. yeah. So the question was, how do you do that? Thank you, folks. Good work, Mike. <laughs>